lesson we're going to be talking about a topic that is one of my favorite subjects to teach in the IB and AP economics syllabus. Today's topic will be about market failure. Market failure may not sound like something interesting, but in fact it is a very interesting topic for students, particularly those who are interested in the environment. Market failure is the examination of a particular instance in which the free market, in other words, when private consumers and private sellers interact with one another, and the equilibrium level of output actually reduces the overall welfare or efficiency in society. So let's come up with a clear definition here and then we'll show some different types of market failure using a supply and demand diagram. Let's begin with the clear definition of market failure. A market failure exists whenever the free market equilibrium quantity of output in a market is greater or less than the socially optimal quantity of output. In other words, if a market left to its own devices produces either too much or too little of a good, we say that that market has failed. In other words, it has failed to achieve the socially optimal level of output. But this raises the question, what exactly is meant by socially optimal or efficient? How do we know if the level of output in a particular market is the right amount of output? Well, this requires us to examine the supply and demand for a particular good with a slightly different perspective. Rather than looking at a demand and supply diagram purely as the supply and demand, we must begin to examine supply and demand in the context of marginal costs and marginal benefits of the producers and consumers of the good being discussed. Now since we're going to be talking about costs and benefits, we can think of our vertical axis, which is usually labeled P, as representing the benefits and the costs of consumers in that market and of society as a whole. Of course, we'll still be measuring the quantity of output in the market and we will still think of the equilibrium points as the equilibrium quantity and the equilibrium price. So far there's nothing all that different about our graph here. We see that we have the upward sloping supply curve and the downward sloping demand curve. The only difference though is that we're also considering supply as representing the marginal cost of production of the particular good and demand representing the marginal benefits to the consumers of that good. So when does a market failure exist? Let's begin with a particular type of market failure known as negative externalities of production. First we'll define it and then we'll show what it would look like on a graph if there is a negative externality of production. A negative externality of production exists whenever the production of a particular good creates spillover costs for society as a whole that are not borne by the producer of that good. So looking back at our diagram here, we can look at the supply curve, which represent the costs of production for the producers of good X in this case. Now we're going to look at the supply curve in a new way. Rather than calling it just the marginal cost, we're going to look at supply as representing the marginal private cost. In other words, the costs faced by the actual producers of that good. So MPC, marginal private cost, equals the cost of production as seen by the actual producer of the good. A firm's marginal private cost therefore entails the labor costs that that firm faces, the costs of raw materials, the costs of energy, and so on, and other inputs that the firm faces and must pay for in the production of a good. Now what happens when there's a negative externality? As we said, a negative externality exists if the social costs of production are greater than the private costs. So we can actually add a second marginal cost curve to our graph here which exists above the marginal private costs of production. This curve we will label marginal social cost. Notice that the marginal social cost of production of this good is greater than the marginal private costs. This implies that there are external costs not borne by the producer of this good but borne by society as a whole. So what are some examples of the external costs that might arise from the production of a good? Good X, of course this is a very generic good, but good X could represent anything that in the production process creates pollution. Pollution, of course, exists when a firm cheaply disposes of its waste in a way that harms the environment and possibly the health of others in society. Therefore, pollution can be considered an external cost of production. In addition to pollution in the form of air pollution or water pollution, external costs may involve health costs, perhaps the health of the workers in this industry whose health is jeopardized by the production. So external costs may be higher health costs 
for people employed in the production of this good. Of course, pollution and higher health costs are just two examples of external costs that might arise from the production of a particular good. But the point is that when we examine the marginal social cost of production in the case of a good creating a negative externality, it will always be above the marginal private cost. Now when we look at marginal benefit, we see that this represents the demand for the consumers of good X. Of course, it's downward sloping because the more of good X that is consumed, the less additional benefit society as a whole receives. But what we see is that when the marginal benefit intersects the marginal social cost of production, what we end up with is a lower quantity demanded and supplied of good X. And the quantity here is what we'll call QSO for the socially optimal quantity. We say that QSO is socially optimal because at this quantity the level of output corresponds with the marginal social costs and the marginal benefit of consumers in this market. If firms were to bear the external costs created by pollution and higher health care costs of the workers in this industry then the actual level of output in this market would be lower than the equilibrium level of output. However, since firms externalize these costs and do not face them, the firm's private costs of production are actually lower than they would be otherwise. Therefore, the quantity that is actually going to be produced in this market of QE is greater than the socially optimal quantity. We can also say that the price of the good of PE will be lower than the socially optimal price which would be seen only if firms themselves were to bear the external costs which instead they are passing on to society as a whole. So as we've seen in this market now there is a quantity being produced that is greater than the socially optimal quantity. We have an overproduction of good X resulting from the external costs that are not borne by the producers. So we have here we can see the overproduction of good X the socially optimal quantity is less than the quantity that is actually being produced. Now what is the result of this overproduction? We see that if society were producing the optimal quantity there would be a higher price for good X meaning that there would actually be less consumer surplus in the market for good X. However in this case since good X is a harmful product that creates pollution and higher healthcare costs, healthcare costs in its production this, this smaller area of consumer surplus is actually beneficial for society as a whole because it means that people are consuming less of this harmful good. In addition, the existence of the negative externality creates a deadweight loss or a welfare loss equal to this purple triangle. The purple triangle shows us the external costs borne by society resulting from the overproduction of this good. So this represents the welfare loss resulting from a level of output equal to QE. The implication is that if the quantity supplied actually decreased to QSO, this loss of welfare would no longer exist. We would eliminate a deadweight loss if we could somehow reduce the equilibrium quantity from QE to QSO. Society would be better off with less of this good. So let's review what we've seen in the graph here. We showed that the private cost of production for good X is lower than it would be if it were to incorporate all of the external costs including pollution and the higher health care costs of workers in this industry. Therefore the marginal social cost which we've defined here equals the private costs of production plus the external costs borne by society as a whole. If producers of good X were to bear the external costs themselves then the quantity produced in this market would be lower. It would be equal to QSO rather than QE. And society as a whole would be better off by an amount represented by the purple triangle. The purple triangle represents the welfare loss resulting from an overproduction of good X. So this raises a question. How can government deal with the existence of negative externalities? In our previous unit we talked about various types of government intervention in markets. We also explained that in most cases a tax on a particular good or a subsidy for a particular good or a price control will actually lead to a loss of total welfare due to the inefficiency that results from governments intervening in the free market. But in this case we see that without government intervention a free market it's, will be inefficient on its own. That's what our purple triangle represents. It represents the deadweight loss of the free market equilibrium price and quantity. 
So what can we do, what can a government do to reduce the size of this welfare loss? As we learned in our last unit, there is a particular type of government intervention in a market that increases the cost of production faced by firms. Of course, what I'm talking about is an excise tax. So let's consider the effects of a tax on the production of good X. As we know, a tax increases the marginal private costs of production. So if the government were to levy a per unit tax on the production of good X, then this would increase the marginal private costs of production and move the MPC curve closer to the marginal social cost curve. Of course, the size of the tax should be as close as possible to the amount of external costs faced by society. So the optimal tax will actually equal the size of the per unit externality. A tax that shifts marginal private cost upward will lead to a lower quantity demanded and supplied of good X and hopefully reduce the size of the negative externality resulting from good X's production. So what we'd expect to happen is that a tax equal to the amount of the externality will shift the marginal private cost curve upwards until it equals the marginal social cost. So our new MPC with the tax, if the tax is of the right size, will equal the marginal social cost. And now, of course, firms facing higher costs of production will reduce the quantity of output that they produce, hopefully to the socially optimal level. Now what we see is that in the market for good X, there is an area of consumer surplus equal to the yellow triangle, and now firms who are paying this tax will have less producer surplus, which is shown by the green triangle, and some tax revenue will be generated by taxing good X. The amount of tax revenue is equal to the blue rectangle here. It's the amount of the per unit tax times the quantity of QSO, which is what ideally will be produced following the corrective tax on the production of good X. Now, in our previous unit, when we studied the effect of a per unit tax, we said that the triangle on the right here, this purple triangle, was the deadweight loss of a tax. But in this unit, we can't think of it as deadweight loss because before the tax existed, the purple triangle represented the deadweight loss resulting from the overproduction of the good. In fact, this tax is what we call a corrective tax. As opposed to reducing overall welfare in the market, a tax on the production of a good that creates negative externalities increases overall welfare in the market by the size of the purple triangle. The purple triangle before was welfare loss. Now, because there will be less of this harmful good produced, the purple triangle represents welfare gained. So to summarize, we looked at the example of a negative externality of production, good X. This could be something like coal generated electricity, which as most people realize, creates lots of environmental problems, including the contribution it makes to global warming and the increase in the case of lung cancers and asthma and other types of negative health effects for consumers and producers. By taxing the production of something like coal electricity, Governments can actually increase the private costs of production for coal burning electricity manufacturers, which will lead to a higher equilibrium price paid by consumers, but a more optimal quantity. Society will be better off with less electricity being generated by coal. People's health will improve, and the government will raise some tax revenue, which it could use, as we'll discuss in a later part of this unit, to help subsidize cleaner forms of energy. So this tax actually increases the overall efficiency in the market for coal generated electricity. Even though there is lower level of output and a higher price for consumers and producers enjoy a lower price, as we see here, the producer price will be lower since they have to pay the tax. Overall welfare is improved by the area represented by the purple triangle. In our next lesson, we're going to talk about a different type of market failure. This one was about negative externalities of production. In the next lesson, we'll talk about negative externalities of consumption. What if it's not the production of a good that harms society as a whole, but the consumption of that good? So stay tuned for our next video lesson, which will explore different types of externalities.